Amen, amen. Give somebody a high five next to you. Tell them, welcome home. You look good. You look really good. Awesome. You should tell them, no, you look better. <laughs> you know, it's amazing to me how many, um, how many times God has uh, just been so faithful, you know, so patient, so kind, so good. And we're here today in his house because he invited us, because he brought us here. Uh, you know, I was, uh, I don't know if you guys know this story, most of you guys do, but I got invited to eat one day. Uh, I was in Colombia, and uh, to have dinner, this like private dinner with the president's son. And, uh, and I felt so honored, you know, it was like the best restaurant in Bogota, in Colombia. We had like a squad of like seven cars, you know, pull up, clear out the place. They had their M4s or, you know, their rifles. And uh, it was only us. They actually brought down the cook from wherever he was. It was like this whole ceremonial, beautiful thing. Uh, of course, Colombians don't eat chile, so I made sure that he got, you know, he, he tried a little bit of spicy there. And he, you know, anyway, so um, <clears throat> they said I tried to kill him. Just kidding. No, I didn't. No, uh, but, but it was really cool. It was like this honor. And to be very honest, like, he doesn't remember me. He doesn't know my name. He probably, you ask him about who Pablo is, he has probably no clue at all. And I don't really remember what we talked about. I remember that there was this honor. It was such an honor to be there. But, I mean, you're today in the house of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The, you know what I mean? The creator of heaven and earth, the one who made us all, who, who allows us to breathe today, who let you borrow one more day to be with your family. Can I mean, just give him one more round of applause? Is that cool? We've been talking about this road to perfection, right? If you've been here uh, for the last few weeks, you know that we've been talking about this, this part in the scripture of 2 Peter chapter 1, where he begins to describe how to become more like Christ, how to be godly. And that's something that we kind of, as a church, not us, but church wor worldwide, kind of stop, stop, stop shooting so high. We kind of try to lower the standard as to not ruffle any feathers, to not make anybody feel uncomfortable. And yet Christ says, be holy as I am holy. Be perfect as I am perfect. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a line that we have to say, okay, where do we go? Do we strive for perfection? Do we, per, for perfection, as I say it wrong. Do we strive for perfection? Do we try to be better? Do we say, God, every day I will try to be like you? Or do we just say, oh, well, I'm just human. Nobody's perfect. Or do we say, God, I want to be more like you? As you know, Peter gives us a description of how we ought to grow. How do, how do we develop to be more Christ-like? Why is it important to be more Christ-like? Because as we become Christ-like, people around us are impacted by his love, by his grace, by his character. Amen? Because it's not just about us. Because as we grow, as we continue to develop, we become efficient. We become people that God can use in a world that desperately Desperately needs it. Amen. And so today I want to share with you guys the next step of the road to perfection. We covered the first day faith. The next day we covered moral excellence. This is 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4. Let's go to verse 5. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 5. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence to your faith. There's one. Supply moral excellence. And in your moral excellence, knowledge. That's the third, right? So faith, moral excellence, knowledge. And on Friday we covered, which one did we cover on Friday? That was, at least it was for me important. It was good. We need more self-control. Amen? So if you haven't gotten it, uh, if you weren't here on Friday, it's okay. Check it out. We have it on YouTube. And then it says, on your self-control, add perseverance. Perseverance. Say it with me, perseverance. 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 As you guys know, I love football. I, I enjoy uh, American football. Um, I, the NFL, for a long time, it was my religion. <laughs> uh, I used to know all the stats, all the players. I used to debate all the time about it. Uh, and I, I just, I would watch every game that I possibly could. And, uh, you know, and, and it was just the way I was. I played football for about eight years of my life, and I really, really enjoyed it. Back at APU, I don't, uh, I don't remember a single day that I didn't think about football. And my favorite player, and this is controversial to most many of you who know football, my favorite player was Emmitt Smith. Now, Emmitt Smith is not uh, the best running back in the world. But Emmitt Smith had something. He played for the Cowboys, the Dallas Cowboys, America's, America's team. Uh, so anyway, so this, this guy had something so special. Emmitt Smith has the record for the most rushing yards. You guys know what that means, that he's the guy that ran the furthest. He's the guy that's run the most out of all of NFL running back history. 
It used to be Walter Payton, number 34, or the, the Bears. But then this amazing man came, Emmett Smith. Now, it's controversial because they said he had the best, you know, O-line and all that stuff, that he wasn't even that good. But I want to tell you something. I want to read to you a couple stats about it. And I, I want you to think about this. This guy ran a little bit more than a mile, right? It's just a mile. Except he ran that mile, or a little bit more than a mile, with 11 guys that are huge, yoked, super athletes trying to destroy him. They were hitting him every single play, every single down. Emmett Smith ran 1, 1,800, no, 18,355 yards in his career. 18,355 yards in his career. He had 4,409 carries. His average run was 4.2 yards. One, two, three, four. That was his average run. Every time he would go 4.2 yards, boom, he would get destroyed by somebody. He would get tackled by somebody else. Every 4.2 yards, he would get hit once and again and again and again. Emmett Smith was not the greatest, but Emmett Smith had this amazing ability of getting back up. He kept on getting up, kept on getting hit, and kept on going. This guy had something so special. He ran over a mile. That doesn't sound special. But he ran over a mile falling every 4.2 yards, getting beat up every 4.2 yards, and he kept on doing it over and over and over, 164 touchdowns in his career. Listen, every 4.2 yards, and he ran 18,355 of those. Why am I sharing with you this? I know some of you guys, I don't care about football, Pastor. I don't care about NFL. I don't even care about what you're talking about right now. I just want to go eat some tacos, you know? But the fact of the matter is this, every single one of us, we need perseverance. We have to have perseverance. If you don't have perseverance, it doesn't matter how amazing you are today. It doesn't matter what you know, how many degrees, what a beautiful family if you have. But if you don't have perseverance, you will lose it all tomorrow. If you don't have perseverance, the faith that you have today is not enough for tomorrow. Please listen. If we have no perseverance, we may say we have all these things and you may even just be amazingly gifted in what you do. But man, we need the perseverance that God gives us. And the question is this, how can we persevere in the middle of this world, in the middle of this age, in the midst of so much turmoil, so many things against us? I know there's a lot of preachers still talking about COVID. I don't want to talk about COVID and pandemic because I think that the longer we talk about that, the more we feel like victims of, of our world. I mean, we have conquered. We are here. We're alive today. Give yourselves a huge round of applause. Amen. But there's this story in the Bible of this woman, this woman that encountered intense opposition. I mean, worse than 11 guys trying to tackle her every, every 4.2 yards. Worse than, than, than this, this athletes. She encountered the worst kind of opposition. This woman in the Bible, she's found in Mark chapter 5, verse 24. Can you guys go there with me? Mark chapter 5, verse 24. We're going to read it. Ready? Set? Hi. <laughs> and he went off with him. And the large crowd was following him, capital H, that's talking about Jesus, and pressing in on him. So Jesus is going this, his way. He's going to go heal this young girl. She's like 12 years old. She's about to die. She's the daughter of this official. His name is Jairus. And he, he's on his way to heal her. All the disciples are on the way with him. Kind of like when, when a kid in high school is about to get in a fight and they're all going together like all fast, you know. And the whole crowd is following him. And Jesus is on his way to get it done. He's on his way to get it done. And all of a sudden this woman... I call her Bloody Mary. You'll see why. Just kidding. No, this woman interrupts her so bad. Anyway, this, this woman interrupts Jesus. On, no, sorry. On his way, on his way, this woman stops Jesus. And, and, and here's what happens, okay? This is this huge interruption in the middle of this chapter. And if you skip her story, you'll just go right into Jerry's story. And this little girl dies. And Jesus comes and says, he's not dead. She's sleeping. And boom, boom, boom. And brings her back to life. And it's an amazing story. But in the middle of that amazing story, you'll find this woman going through a really tough time. Here we go. A woman who had a hemorrhage for 12 years. This woman had been bleeding for how long? 12 years. So as long as the little girl was alive, this girl or this woman had been suffering, bleeding every single day of her life. Every day, life was sifting out of her. Every day, life was drained out of her. And had enough, had endured so much at the hands of many physicians, many doctors, and had spent all she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. After hearing about Jesus, she came up in the crowd behind him and touched 
his cloak. For she thought, if I just touch his garments, I will get well. Immediately, the flow of her blood was dried up. And she felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Immediately, Jesus, perceiving in himself that the power proceeding from him had gone forth, turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you see the crowd passing in on you, I mean, pressing in on you, and you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see the woman who had done this. But the woman, fearing and trembling, aware of what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your affliction. Amen and amen. This is amazing. And sometimes we forget that the Bible stories are not fables. These are actual stories of people who actually walked. These are eyewitnesses account. This eyewitness account. This is somebody who wrote about somebody they saw who actually was healed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. This, 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 the power of God healed this woman. I want you to know this, that as we hear these stories, it's easy to say, oh, yeah, it's somebody else. I, will, I, don't, I don't struggle with this. I don't struggle with that. But I want you to know that this woman, she had this hemorrhage. She's bleeding from her body for 12 years. And that may not be your case. But there may be somebody here who has a bleeding heart. Somebody here who's been struggling with something else for maybe more than 12 years. Or maybe you've been here and you say, man, pastor, I've tried everything before. This woman says, the Bible says that this woman has gone to every doctor possible. Every physician she could find. And she, instead of getting helped, she grew worse. I don't know about you, what your struggle is. I don't know what you're going through. But the fact of the matter is this. We all go through something. We all have a story. Every single one of us here have a story. Every one of us is a world in itself. Every one of us here have a struggle. And this is the beautiful thing that this woman has been struggling for 12 years. No one can help her. And yet she still had the courage to say, I still can be healed. The first thing that we have to overcome, the first area that we have to persevere in our own lives is against discouragement of the facts of our lives. The fact of the matter is, is that she was, she was what? She was sick. It wasn't a lie. It wasn't a fable. It wasn't an exaggeration. She was sick. You know, life will slap you in the face. Life will hit you and tell you these are the facts. The fact is that this is the diagnosis of the doctor. The fact is you have no documents. The fact is that you grew up like this. The fact is that she left you. The fact is that he's not in love with you. The fact is that these kids are having a bunch of problems. The fact is, and the fact, and the fact, and the fact. The first thing we have to overcome, first thing we have to have perseverance in our life is against the facts of life. Because the facts of life are not the truths of God always. Amen. The truth of God always overcomes the facts of life. That may be the fact, but the truth is that my God has the power to heal. My God has the power to redeem. My God has the power to provide. My God has the power to give me victory over any circumstance. The fact is that God is not subject to your facts. Amen. That God is not subject to your facts. Whatever your marriage is going through, whatever area in your life, there may be some facts. And the first area that we have to have if we're going to persevere is persevere over the facts of life. How do we do that if not by the only thing that I know that I've come across that is able to trump facts? And that is the truth. The truth of God stands above the fact of life. This woman for 12 years, 12 years she had been bleeding now, you may say, that's really bad, Pastor. That's, that's hard. But you have no idea how hard it is until you understand the context and the culture that she lived in. According to the Levitical law, this, this Leviticus chapter 15, it talks about this, 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 this woman. Uh, I mean, about, about any woman that would be suffering with this kind of issue, an issue of blood. They said, according to the law, that she would be declared unclean. Unclean means anathema. Unclean means taboo. A person that could not be around you. A person that could not touch anything. A person that cannot be touched by anyone. Otherwise, they themselves will become unclean. The Bible said that this woman would become an outcast. I don't know how she was before these 12 years. I don't know if she was successful. I know she had something because she had lost everything she had. So she had to have had something to lose. 
That means that this woman had done something with her life. Maybe she had her husband and she lost her husband in the process. Maybe she had kids that she couldn't hug anymore because she loved them and she didn't want them to be unclean. Maybe this woman had a bunch of friends. I don't know. Maybe she was the leader of the club of, of senoritas, of the, of the laundry. I don't know. You know, I, maybe this woman had, had a degree. I don't know. All I know is that this woman had something to lose, and she lost it all. This woman, for 12 years, she suffered at the hands of people. This woman, for 12 years, she suffered at the hands of experts. I know people that love God, but they've been hurt for a long time. Hurt at the hand of people. Because we're not God. Because people are imperfect. My boss used to say people are, is the most unperfect product. This product will break. Will let you down. This product will betray you. This product will make you think and hurt you. I was like, oh my gosh. This is bad. But then I realized something. That my God, my King, my Lord, my Savior. He will never leave me, nor abandon me, nor forsake me. He will not let you down. The problem is, is that this person, this woman, had put all her trust in people. And the Bible says, curse is the man who trusts in the man. What does that mean? What does that mean? That if somebody's not holding you up, they cannot let you down. The only one that can hold us up is Jesus Christ. His name is Jesus. Amen. And so this is so beautiful because this woman is struggling. And yet she still has the fortitude within her to say, one more chance. One more chance. Today we want to talk about life class. Life class is, is an opportunity. I went to an encounter over 15 years ago, and my life has never been the same. I'm trying to think of how many years. Actually, it's almost 20 years ago now. My sister went to this encounter, okay? This, this, this place where you go and, and you spend two days, three days with just God. Three days asking God to change you. Three days of uninterrupted ministration. Three days of... Allowing God to set you free from bondages, to heal your heart, to fill you with his spirit, to renew your vision, to renew something in you that had died, dreams. Allowing God to, and to me this is one of the best parts, to forgive you but also to forgive other people. Three days of encounter. My sister was completely transformed, completely changed. And when she came back, she said, Pablo, you have to go to this encounter. And my sister and I had a really bad relationship before that encounter. I mean, we were like enemies i had nothing to do with her she had nothing to do if she said don't touch my bed i'd be like sit on her bed just for fun and it was so bad it was just older sister i was a younger kid and it was just that way it was but can i tell you something my sister's life was so changed that it gave me hope for transformation i said you know what if she changed so much maybe there's something else that i can do one of the things that we have to overcome is a fact but the next thing that we have to overcome is self-sufficiency this idea that I don't need God, that I'm already doing well. Listen for a second, please. What if this woman would have said, you know what? I'm bleeding, but I'm going to be all right. I'm bleeding, but I don't need any man. I don't need anyone. Look what they've done to me. I'm good enough. I'm all right. I'm going to find my own cure. And Jesus would have walked to the next town and he would have just left. And she would have lost the opportunity of a lifetime. I don't know if this happens in your family, but in my family, we used to sweep everything under the rug. If you don't talk about it, it must not exist. I know your family's probably not like that. But in my family, sometimes we just not say some things. And it's kind of like bills, right? You think that if you don't open them, they disappear. <laughs> they don't disappear. They come back with their friends bigger and bigger and redder, more red. You know, and so this is what used to happen with me in my life. I used to not deal with things and thought that, that it's okay. And I thought I could handle it and I thought I could, I could do it. And one of the biggest problems that we have is that we don't want to ask for help. But we must persevere over our pride. We must persevere over the facts, but we must also persevere over our own, our own self-sufficiency of saying, I don't need anyone. I don't need anything. Listen, this woman was in desperate need. Her life was sifting out of her daily. And the worst thing is that can happen to anyone is not sickness, but not recognizing their sickness. Man, if you're sick, let's go to the doctor of doctors, the physician that could actually heal you. If you need help, it's time to ask for it. If you need help, it's time to go and pursue the answer. How long, how much longer will it go? Listen, it's no coincidence that the little girl was dying and she was 12 years old. 12 has a meaning in the scripture. I don't want to be a numerologist. I've told you guys before. I'm not trying to find the Da Vinci Code. I'm just trying to tell you. I'm just trying to tell you there are numbers and numbers mean something. 
Number, the number 12 is the, govern, the, blah, is the number of government. 12 tribes, 12 hours, 12, you know, in the day, 12 months. You have the 12 disciples. The number 12 describes government. Listen, she had been 12 years under the subjugation, under the government of sickness, of illness, of pain. She's been drained for 12 years. Something had control of her over 12 years. 12 years she had been under this authority. And it's time to change the authority of her life from sickness into health, from sadness into joy, from desperation, come on, into hope. And I know, I know, because I have seen it with my own eyes, I've experienced it with my own life, and I've seen it in my own family. What happens when you come to Jesus Christ and you truly surrender and you say, God, I need you. Listen, the Bible says that there was all these people all these people. I need 10 guys. Come up here real quick. 10 guys. 10 guys. Come on, come on. Quick, 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 quick. It's a quick illustration. Go, go, go. No, con esas ganas, no. Come no. on. 10 guys. That's good. That's good. Okay, okay. Okay, cool, cool. So I want you guys to do something, okay? I want you guys to get really close to me, all of you, and try to, all of you, put a hand on me. All 10 of you. All 10. Like, all oh, more, more, more. All the way. I try to press in a little tighter, a little tighter. And I'm going to walk, okay? I'm going to try to walk. I'm going to try to walk. And this is Jesus. Oh, you guys are stronger than I thought. <laughs> all right. All right. So this is Jesus trying to walk through the crowd. And he's like, hold on. Who touched me? Who touched me? Sorry about the spinning. So who touched me? All right. Who touched me? And the disciples are like, what are you talking about, Jesus? Everyone touched you. Everyone's trying to get a piece of Jesus. Yes or no? Right, this is Jesus walking, remember, like, like, like a high school fight, right? About to go heal the little girl, but everybody's still trying to get a piece of Jesus. Okay? Think about this, okay? And Jesus is like, who touched me? Right? I think the disciples were in a hurry, too. They knew that this little girl was dying. So they're like, Jesus, are you serious right now? Like, really? You're going to ask who touched you when all of us here are really close? And everybody's trying to, trying to get a piece of you? But there was one person that touched him different. There was only one person that Jesus stopped for, okay? And Jesus started looking through them, each one of them. There was something different in one of them. Now, there was a huge crowd of them. There was so many people, the Bible says thronging, like, like pressing in on him, squeezing him, touching him, grabbing. Think about that. But one of them was different. What was so different about, about, about that one person's touch? What caused Jesus to stop? Thank you, guys. Give him a big round of applause. You guys may go back. Amazing actors, you have a future in Hollywood. Listen, what was so different about this one touch? You see, curiosity, people are curious about God. And they come and they want a piece of him. And they want to go to church and show up and see what it's about. Is the music good? You know, eh, today was great, but eh, it was too loud. It was too, uh, it's too long, too short. Oh my goodness, jeans? They're tight. They're not tight enough. You know, I don't know. Everybody wants something with Jesus. They want a piece of Jesus. But this woman wanted something different. Listen, I love that this woman said, if I could only touch his garment. She wasn't trying to get his number. His, he, she, wasn't trying to, she wasn't trying to get a one-on-one, -on -one, sit down with him. He wasn't, he wasn't trying to get his hands and lay it on her head. She just wanted to get close enough to touch him. She didn't care about everything else. She didn't want to be known even. She just wanted to be close enough. To have an encounter with God, to desire the Lord, it sets you apart in his, in his eyes. What God was looking for was someone who was desperate enough to draw everything from him. You notice that it wasn't even, God didn't even realize. Like Jesus didn't even know who had touched him. Now, and God knows, dude, if anyone knows is God. I think this was here on purpose. I think God is so interested in someone's hunger, someone's faith. More than their appearance, more than everything outside. I think God says, and I don't think I know, because I know I read the scripture. It says that the eyes of the Lord look through and fro throughout the entire earth, seeking whose heart is desperately his, who is actually looking for him. I think God's spirit, God's eyes are going through this place saying, who actually wants me? Who desires me? Who wants an encounter with me? Who wants not just the experience, but who wants to be near me? He said, if I, this woman had something so special. She said, if I could only get close enough to Jesus. And that enamored my Lord. My God loved that. All these other people touching him. But one was different. What if I said to you tonight that God is looking for you? He's desiring you. But the great question is, does God love you? 
You see, religion is God's desire, God's effort to try to reach God. But Christ is God reaching down from heaven, approaching you and I. Christ is the evidence of God saying, I come to you. All these religions trying to get to God, trying to be good, trying not to sin. And yet God is the one pursuing you today. He's the one chasing you. That's the difference between Christ and all the others. All those that are in the tomb that are buried. All those that are still names and amazing and, and very, very, many of them very virtuous. But none of them, none of them have an empty grave. Only Jesus Christ. The most beautiful thing about God is that he came down to heaven. He showed himself. He presented himself to you. He came to be among us. But he didn't stay here. He conquered death to give us victory as well. Why am I saying this? Come on, give God a round of applause. Why not? But why am I saying this with you? Why am I sharing this? Because you have to overcome, like we said in the beginning, the facts of life. Do not get so discouraged where you don't reach out to God anymore. You know, don't, the, the facts are something, but the truth is something so much more, so much better. For his ways are higher than our ways. Amen. And his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Second thing we have to fight against is the pride of saying, I don't need. How many Christians today have stopped drawing from the power of God? I wonder how many religious people today are still around the presence of God but have stopped drawing the power from heaven. How many are still today so close yet so far from God? You see, because it's not Jesus who determines that. It is you and I who determine what power of God we receive. You bring a bucket, you'll get a bucket. You bring a little cup, that's all you're going to get. I say today, you don't stop at anything. You say, God, I want all of you. I want to have an encounter with you every single day of my life. I don't want to just be around you. I want you, Lord. I want you and me to have an encounter today. Amen. It's the second thing. that The third thing that this woman had to overcome is people's opinions. Like I said to you, she was unclean. She was this woman that was not supposed to be touching anyone. And yet she had to go through the crowd. I want you to go back to that story with me. I, 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 am, I, I love pictures and, wor and, and, and word pictures. And, and, and I could see the movie in my head. This, this woman perhaps was wearing this hood as to, as to not be seen as, as, the, as Mary. You know, the woman that everybody knew. And she's, she's pushing her way through the crowd and trying to hide her face from her neighbor. And, and people are like, hey, hey, I was here first. And maybe, maybe they're trying to get their kid in front of Jesus. Or, or maybe there's this, this person, you know, that everybody's carrying because she can't walk or he can't walk. And yet she's pushing her way through. She's trying to fight her way through. And you know what can happen to this woman? It's not just shame. It's not just somebody pointing out and say, hey, unclean, unclean. By the law, they were allowed to stone her. They're allowed to kill her. Because now she had affected the whole community. Because now she had brought her sin upon everybody else. And so she feared for her own life. She feared the rejection of others. She feared the looks of other people, the words, the insults. She feared and yet, she still desired. And she still persevered. She persevered through the opinion of people. One of the things that stops people from knowing God is the opinion of others. What will my family say? What will the people say? What will they all think of me? What if I become... But what if you get close enough to God where everything else doesn't matter? What if you say, God, what I care most about is my relationship with you? Then someone... I was in high school, and this coach that I had, his name was Coach Herbstreit, a man of God, a man who loved Jesus. He even looked like him. He had a beard, and I don't know if Jesus really looked like that, but, you know, he, the, the whole life. Anyway, so, so this guy was so awesome. He was so amazing. And uh, I remember the last day of, uh, of, our, uh, uh, of our football banquet. We had a football banquet where they give up the awards, you know, and they give them all to me. I'm just kidding. Like, they give up all these awards, and Coach was there, and, he, and they told Coach Herbstreit, if you're going to share... You cannot say this word, this word, this word. This. You cannot say blessed. You cannot say Jesus. You cannot say Lord and Savior. You, and they just really told them, like, you cannot say all these things. Do you, are you going to say them? And coach is just quiet. Because see, every coach was supposed to give words. And so my coach stands up there. And what the people there that were sanctioning him, I mean, quieting him, didn't know, is that through his life, 47 of us have completely turned around. Through his life and his prayers and his he would meet us at the pole after every practice, and he would just gather around us, and he would just pray for us. He would ask us about our lives, about our struggles. He never judged us. He was always there for us. 
He would bring us over to his house. His wife was there and his, his kids. And they would do so much that no one else would ever do. You know what? He had the authority to say whatever he wanted with us. You know why? Because he loved us, because he cared about us. And he said right up there, he said, you know what? I know I was told not to say that Jesus is my Lord and Savior, which I love. And he began to say all the things that they didn't tell him to say. And I'm not going to say those things. He said, instead, I'm going to tell you guys that I love you because there's a love in my heart that can never go away. And listen, in spite of the opinion of others, in spite of the job that he was at risk, and I'm not saying we go and be foolish and just smash people with the Bible in the face, but I think this guy had something so special, and that's why we admired him. That he wasn't a respecter of man. He was a respecter of God. Amen. That his authority was clear. His authority was God. Now, why did I enjoy so much being near this man? Because this man changed so much of who we are. He changed my life. He changed so much of us. This, he, this coach, he didn't have to do these things. But because he understood that God is above all. And this woman understood something. She said, you know what? Who cares? If people see me one way, if I'm still broken. Who cares if people have the greatest opinion? As a matter of fact, people are always going to have their opinion. Whatever's in their heart, that's what they will say. Because out of the abundance of the heart, speaks the mouth. So people will have their opinions. But this woman had to have the perseverance to overcome opinions and to get close enough to Christ to have an encounter with him. Amen. I admire this woman so much because she said, even if, I'm still going to go for it. Even if. My family says it. Even if my neighbors, even if everybody around me tries to stone me, I'm still going to get close to Jesus. Let me finish with one last testimony. My, my, my mom, uh, she gave her life to Christ. She surrendered her life to Jesus. She was a, a nun. She had already her, her, how do you call it? Habitos, we call them in Spanish. Her dresses, the, the nun thing. I don't want to say custom because it's not a custom. It's a habit. Yeah, let's just call it the habit. No, that's the burger joint. Um, <clears throat> She had the robe. Anyway, my mom is an amazing woman, amazing woman. And she gave her life to Christ. And you know what I'm thing is that her mom didn't even go to my, my, my mom's wedding. She's, I'm not going to go to that wedding because she's meeting, marrying a Protestant, a Protestant, a, a Christian, you know, an evangelical. And so my dad was also darker skin. Now, I, I know you guys think like racism is like this, this thing that's happening and all this thing, but it's been going on for a long time. And it's not just in the U.S. So my, my father was a little bit darker. A lot darker and my father had this this like like really cool hair and six buttons all the way up here bell bottoms fro mustache he looked sweet he was awesome my dad loved Jesus with all of his heart he loved God with everything but my grandma she came from a different descendants my grandma wouldn't have that man for her daughter but the worst part of him was that he was a Christian he was a Jesus freak he was a Jesus lover and my mom decided to marry that Jesus freak anyway. I thank God so much. Come on now. But the story doesn't end there because I understand. And this is not a, a jab against Catholicism to the country. I've learned so much and so did my mom. I believe some Catholics are more Christians than evangelicals. I believe some Catholics love Jesus so much more. I have seen it with my own eyes. I've seen some people that claim to be Christian and they're not Christian then. Their life, their evidence is not there. And I've seen some Catholics, their theology might not be straight from the scripture. But their heart is for Christ. They love Jesus with all their hearts. Why am I telling you guys this? I'm not talking about religions right now. I'm talking about what happened in my family. My grandma, she was this stubborn woman. Stubborn as can be. Really stubborn. Well, this stubborn old lady gave her life to Christ through none other than my father. My father held her hands and led her to the feet of Jesus. She surrendered her life to Christ. She gave everything to Jesus. And I know I'll see her in heaven again. I'll be able to hug her because she believed in Jesus. Why am I saying this to you? Because my father and my mom went on to be missionaries. They continued to serve God. They continued to serve Jesus. My mother lost all her wealth. My family was very wealthy from my mom's side. They disowned her completely. No one would help her. When my father died... I was only two months old. No one came to her aid. A single mom in Mexico City and all the wealthy family completely disowned her because she was a Jesus freak. And can I say this? My father in heaven never abandoned me, never ever left me. We had everything we ever needed. Everything we ever needed. My mom continued to serve God. And we don't say that out of spice. We don't need you. No, no, no. My uncle gave her life to Christ. My aunt gave her life to Jesus. One after the other, they continue to know the love of God. Let me tell you why. 
Because this woman and this man never stopped following Christ in spite of the opinion of others. Their opinion may be there because they have seen things that they don't agree, maybe bad examples. But if you, tie, if you tie yourself to the opinion of people, you can never help them. If you don't change, how could you change your family? If you don't change, how could you help some, somebody else out? You have to have the fortitude to say, God, I love you and I will chase you no matter what, no matter who, no matter what the world says, no matter what I lose. If I gain you, I've gained the whole thing. For what is the profit of man to win the whole world if he loses his soul, Jesus said. So today, I want to ask you to do one last thing. I want you to stand up with me for a second, please. We're about to go into a moment. This church goes through seasons. This is a new season. It's a season of life class. Now, life class is not an event. It's a wave. It's a move. It's a move of God. We want to invest, Eoni and I personally, time with you guys, an hour of helping you walk with Jesus Christ. If you haven't yet had your encounter with God, maybe you've gone to church Maybe you came here a couple weeks, a few weeks, or maybe you grew up in church. Maybe you were a pastor's kid like me, a missionary's kid. But I realized although I was there and I was touching God, there was so much more that I needed, so much more that he had for me. So what we're going to do, starting today, today we have the life class party. You go outside, there's going to be food, heaters. <laughs> there's going to be, you know, all kinds of games. There's going to be cool stuff. You're going to be able to sign up. But it's not sign up for an activity. This is not an activity. This is not some game. This is us trying to reach Jesus. This is us touching the hand of Jesus Christ and saying, God, I want you to heal me. I want you to change me. I want your power. I will not settle for nearness. I want intimacy. I want intimacy. Not just nearness. Come on now. I want intimacy with you, God. I don't want to be just close. C.S. Lewis said something. He said, I find in myself a desire which no experience in the world can satisfy the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world C.S. Lewis says if there's something inside of you that says nothing in this world has been able to satisfy it could it be that you're made for another world for another level another degree another degree of intimacy of love another way I don't know if you ever felt that way before but the fact of the matter is is that God alone satisfies this woman when she touches Jesus man this is so beautiful when she touches Jesus power comes from Christ and the Bible says that healing happened in her body the blood dried up and she knew she was healed and I love it because God could have stopped there God could have said okay lady that's enough and he could have kept on walking and healed the 12 year old little girl and that's it but he didn't he had to stop he had to turn around and he had to ask who it was and my question is why didn't he already heal her? Did the power not go forth already? And the answer is simple. Is that one thing is to be healed physically. Another thing is to be healed socially, emotionally. And anyway, God didn't want to stop there. He wanted to keep on going in her life. He wanted the process to continue. Because see, she was unclean. Everybody knew she was unclean. When her little, little kids would go to school, they were like, oh, you're, oh yeah, your mom's the unclean lady, right? The, the, the bloody Mary, the one that's always bleeding. Your, your mom is the one that used to be my mom's friend, but not anymore. Because now if my mom gets closer, they're going to talk bad about her too. You see, she was jacked up, not only physically, but emotionally. Could you imagine? Could you imagine what it is to not be touched for 12 years? No one hugs you. No one ever gets close enough to put a hand on you when you're sad, when you're down, when you're crying, when you're alone. That nobody would come and visit. Can you imagine 12 years of isolation? 12 years, you talk about depression. This woman was alone, truly alone for 12 years. She lost everything she had. She was the product of what people back then would consider a sinful life because she had to do something to the servant. And yet Jesus stops, turns around the rabbi, the one that everybody admires and says, you, I have touched. Now you're the byproduct of my, my power, of my grace, of my love. And he makes sure, not only that she knew, because she already knew, he makes sure everybody around knows that she's different, that she has changed, that the power from heaven has reached down onto her, and he calls her daughter. He calls her daughter. Hijita, daughter, my little girl. He doesn't say, hey, hey, you. Or by name, he calls her. By now, her new identity, a daughter in Christ, he says, you I love, my daughter. 
everywhere around, what? Yeah, that's right. She's not just somebody. She's my somebody. She's my daughter. And he says, my daughter. And she began to tell him all the truth. She began to confess. I don't know what all the truth was. Bible's not thick enough. Doesn't have enough detail. I don't know if she started talking about how the problem began. I don't know if she began to, to confess her sin or maybe the truth about how she's been treated. But she began to spill her heart to Jesus. And I love what Jesus said. Daughter, your faith has made you well. You are healed from your affliction. I love that Jesus says, not only are you my daughter, but now you're healed. You are healed, not just healthy, you are healed, you are whole. The word there, healed, is also the same word that is used for saved, whole, completely made, new again. And God would say to us tonight, any one of us, any one of you today, who would desire and say, God, I want to be whole. I don't want to just be healthy, I want to be whole. I want to be complete. I don't want to just be healed in one area. I want you to restore me, my family, my generations. I want you to complete the good work that you have begun in this place. God, I want the process. I want the process. I don't want to just that one miracle. I want the life of blessing. Amen. So how do we do this? How do we walk? It's one step at a time. One step at a time. Today I told Eoni, Amor, I don't want to do an altar call today. I don't want people to come to the front today. I want people to go to that table. And it's not that I want people to go to the table. I've seen what it happens when you go through life class. Life class is this place where not only do you start learning how to live according to the scripture. It's a place where God begins to process you. He begins to process and process through his word. Through encouraging the encouragement of people that also are walking with Christ. It's putting faith into actions. Not just desire. Everybody wants. Does everybody want bad enough to walk? Not just talk? And that is the difference. A lot of people want to go to church, but they don't want to go to God. And I would just encourage you, go to God. Go to God. Now, by the way, if you can't go, blah, 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 that's fine. Don't feel judged, condemned. It'll be another cycle. But why wait? They say that the best day to plant a tree was 25 years ago. The second best day is today. Isn't that true? They also say that about investments, but tree sounds a lot less depressive. I say today is the greatest day to invest into the rest of your life. Amen? Close your eyes. Let me pray for you. Let me pray that God would help you overcome the obstacles of self-sufficiency, pride, circumstances, opinions. Maybe there are facts like I don't have enough time, enough money. I don't have a car. I don't have this. I don't have that. And, and I would just say to you, those are truths. Yeah, those are facts. But the truth is God loves you. He can provide. He'll open a way. He'll make it happen. If you walk Bible says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. I love it because his steps are a lot bigger than ours. Just get close to him. He'll get close to you. God, I thank you so much because today there are people here that are hungry for you. God, there are people here that are not just part of the crowd. There are people that are truly desiring an encounter with you. God, thank you because we've seen transformation after transformation. We've seen people here, God, rise and change. We have seen people, God, surrender their lives to you. And I just ask you right now that if anyone in this place desires to walk with you, truly be healed, truly be restored, renewed, God, that they would take the next step of faith and say, I don't want to just listen. I want to do. I want to walk. I want to do something, God, that may cost me something. It may cost me time. It may cost me effort. But God, here I am. I am at your feet. Jesus, thank you so much because today you still turn around. You turn around. God, you turn around for anyone who desires you, who wants you. You're, you're still doing amazing miracles throughout the world, yet you stop for me. You stop for those that desire to be with you. God, thank you so much. Because even though you were on your way to bring somebody back to life, you cared about the person that was struggling and hurting right as you were on your way. Thank you, God, because you turned around. Because you were not too busy. And you're not too busy for anyone in here. Thank you so much, Jesus. Thank you, God. Why don't you just begin to ask God. Ask Him right now to help you persevere, to help you overcome any arguments, any excuses. Come on, ask God to give you the fortitude, the perseverance. Ask God to show you, to give you the hunger and the desire. Tell Him, God, I want to know you more. Right where you are, it doesn't have to be fancy words. Just tell Him, God, I want you, God. I want you more than ever. I desire you. I don't know how, but I want to have a relationship with you. Come on, tell Him, God, I give you my life. I give you my heart. I surrender it to you. I ask you, God, today that your power would come to me, God. Let your power sift in my life, change my heart, change my life, heal me, God. 
Let your power from heaven, God, transform me and my family. Thank you, Jesus, for everything you've done. If you do nothing else, you've done more than enough. But God, I know there's so much more, so much more in your presence. Right where you are, would you do me a favor? Right where you are with your eyes closed, we just lift up your hands for a second. And that's a sign of surrender to God. It's a sign to say, God, here I am at your presence. I'm not running away anymore. I'm done being chased by you. I am here and I want to be with you, God. I lift up my hands and I say to you, God, you are the Lord. You are worthy of my praise. You're worthy of my life. Why don't we just sing one last song to God and then we go and sign up for life class. Come on.